This is the sixth in a series of messages which are designed to give you an overview of the Bible. I have deliberately tried to avoid in this series any kind of complicated charts or difficult things to memorize because I'm convinced that the essence of the Bible is not to be found in that kind of Bible study. The people who crucified Jesus, you will recall, had studied the Bible in one way or another. Jesus said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me, but you will not come to me that you might have life. So I'm convinced that you could memorize the books of the Bible and still miss the message of the Bible. You could uh, relate from memory or recite from memory a list of the kings or a list of the judges and still not really see the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is love. And when someone comes to your home or to the congregation where you worship, they really do not care to hear you spout off some kind of technical information from the prophets. But they do care how you treat them and how you treat one another. Therefore, it is with considerable reluctance that today we go to a blackboard for perhaps a little different kind of lesson. Our lesson today will be talking about a contrast between the Old Covenant or Old Testament and the New Covenant or New Testament. Now, when the Bible talks about the Old Testament, it is really not talking about the 39 books of the Bible that we so frequently call the Old Testament. In the language of Scripture, the Old Testament was, in fact, the Ten Commandments. Permit me to read for you from the fourth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, verses 11 through 13. And you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire under the midst of heaven, with darkness, clouds, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only you heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, even ten commandments. And he wrote them upon two tablets of stone. Now that same truth is repeated in the fifth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, verses 1 and 2. And Moses called all Israel and said unto them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your ears this day, that you may learn them and keep and do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. And then in the 22nd verse of chapter 5, the scriptures record, These words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount, out of the midst of the fire of the cloud and of the thick darkness, with a great voice, and he added no more. And he wrote them in two tables of stone, and delivered them unto me. So the old covenant in the language of scripture was in fact the Ten Commandments which God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now I want to point out that they were not given to the entire world, they were only given to one group of people, the descendants of Abraham. And this was the nation which God had chosen, and according to the fifth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy in the second verse, he didn't give them, he did not give this covenant to their fathers, but to all of the nation of Israel that were assembled at the foot of Mount Sinai. Now, I also want to point out that this was a law which involved no mercy. That's the very nature of law. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, according to the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews. This law was written upon tablets of stone, as we read a moment ago in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 13. This covenant was placed in a box or receptacle, which was called the Ark of the Covenant. Its dimensions and the way it was constructed is recorded for us in the 25th chapter of the book of Exodus, verses 10 through 22. There was only one place where this nation could worship God, and that was where the Ark of the Covenant was located. In their journeys through the wilderness, wherever the ark was, was where they recognized the presence of God, and that was the place where they worshiped the Lord. 
after they had conquered the land of Canaan, according to the 12th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy in verse 5, they could only worship in one place, and that was the place where Jehovah had chosen to put his name. He put his name in Jerusalem. And when a Jew, a devout Jew, wanted to worship the Lord, wherever he might live, he had to journey to Jerusalem in order to do that. The law was given approximately 50 days after the Passover. Now, in the 19th chapter of the book of Exodus, we find that it was the third month when they came to Mount Sinai. You will recall that they left Egypt at the Passover time, which was the first month and the 15th day of the month. So we have approximately 50 days after the Passover that Moses received the law of God on Mount Sinai. When Moses was receiving the law, the people became unrestrained. They were without any kind of direction from God, and anarchy prevailed. Because the people ate and drank and rose up to play, they were chastened. Remember, the very nature of law is that no mercy was to be shown. And so, according to the 32nd chapter of the book of Exodus and verse 28, every man took his neighbor and every man his brother, and they thrust them through with a sword because they were sinners, and 3,000 people perished at the giving of the law. Death was the result of this covenant, now I'm going to read to you from the 31st chapter of the book of Deuteronomy in verse 26 because the first part of the Bible was not given that you and I might have life. It was given rather to condemn us. Deuteronomy 31, 26. Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God that it may be there for a witness against thee. The law was given not to save us but it was given and it was carefully protected as a witness against us. Moses, who was the giver of the law, could not even be saved by the law. And in the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, we find that Moses made a mistake. Now you will recall that the very nature of a law is no mercy. And so here in the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, we find the story of Moses after they had wandered for some 38 years, or maybe a little bit longer, in the wilderness. The people thirsted for water. And uh, Moses was commanded by God to speak to the rock. Beginning now with the seventh verse of Numbers chapter 20, the Lord said to Moses, Take thy rod and gather thou the assembly together, thou and thy brother Aaron, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So, th so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts a drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto the rock, Hear now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand with his rod, and he smote the rock twice, and water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Now the Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given thee. Now, that may seem like a very technical thing to us, but that's the very nature of law. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point, he's guilty of it all. Earlier in the wilderness wanderings, as it is recorded in the book of Exodus, Moses was commanded to strike the rock, and he did it correctly upon that occasion. But here in the 20th chapter of the book of Numbers, he was not commanded to strike the rock. He was commanded to speak to the rock, but he didn't do what God commanded him to do. He spoke to the people and struck the rock, and that's the reason why God said he could not enter into the land of Canaan because he was imperfect. The whole nature of law was not given in order that men might be saved. We say, why then was it given? Why would a loving God, if God is a God of love, why would he do this to us? Why would he give us commandments which, was, which it was impossible for us to keep? Well, the Bible provides the answer in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24. Here the scriptures teach that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And when we get to Jesus, we're justified by a totally different principle than the principle of law. 
in the second chapter of the book of Colossians and the 10th chapter of the book of Hebrews, this law is called a shadow of good things to come. Now when you look at a shadow, it's sometimes difficult to know what is casting the shadow. If you can see what casts the shadow, then you can understand the shadow more clearly. And those who lived in the days of the old covenant really never understood what was behind the veil. They saw it perhaps dimly by means of, of types and shadows, but they never really understood. As a matter of fact, they didn't dream that God was going to do for mankind what he actually did. We have a revealed religion. Before in our lessons, we have used the word mystery. The Bible word mystery refers to that which at one time was not known, but now has been revealed or unveiled. And the word revelation actually means the removing of a veil. Now we have an Old Testament or an Old Covenant that was Ten Commandments written down on tablets of stone. In the New Testament scriptures we find that we have a totally different kind of a covenant now. And in the eighth chapter of the book of Hebrews, it is spoken of in these words. Hebrews chapter 8 beginning with verse 7. For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that he saith, A new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which, wax, that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So the new covenant is diverse and distinct from the old covenant. The old covenant was written to only one nation. The new covenant is specifically for all the nations of the world. Jesus commissioned his disciples to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. Or, as it is recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and in earth, said Jesus. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Law involves no mercy. But the new covenant involves mercy, as we read just a moment ago, from the 12th verse of Hebrews chapter 8. I will be merciful to their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The first law was written on tablets of stone. The new covenant is diverse and distinct from that in that it is written not on tablets of stone but it is written upon the fleshly tablets of the heart as it is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 3 or as we read a moment ago in Hebrews chapter 8 it is written in our minds and in our hearts. The Old Covenant was placed in a box or receptacle called the Ark of the Covenant. But the New Covenant, because it involves the human heart, makes our temple, or excuse me, our bodies, the temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's what's stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Know you not that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit which you have of God, and you are not your own, you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are the Lord. In the days of the Old Covenant, you had to worship where the Ark of the Covenant was. But since God dwells in our hearts individually and personally, wherever the believer is, he can worship God. This is specifically stated by Jesus in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with, verses, beginning with verse 21. In that particular scripture, he was visiting with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. The Samaritans worshipped on Mount Gerizim. The Jews worshipped 
on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And she said to Jesus, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus responded by saying, You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But woman, believe me, the hour, cometh, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers of the Father shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. They that worship the Father will worship him in spirit and in truth, not in any particular one place. But wherever the believer is, there is the Ark of the Covenant. And there is a temple for the Holy Spirit. When the law was given, it was given 50 days after the Passover, and the new covenant became a reality on the day of Pentecost, which was 50 days after the Passover. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1 talks about they were all together with one place on the day of Pentecost, when there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. There were 3,000 people who perished at the giving of the law, and there were 3,000 people who were saved when the new covenant became a reality. That is recorded for us in the second chapter of the book of Acts and verse 41. And there were added unto them in that same day about 3,000 souls. The old covenant was given and brought death. The new covenant brought life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Moses was condemned by the concept of law but he was justified by the concept of faith. And over in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, we read that by faith Moses' mother hid him because she saw that he was a goodly child. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. By faith he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Jesus that we might be justified by faith. In the fourth chapter of the book of Galatians, there is a little illustration which makes a lot of sense. It talks about Abraham who had two wives and had children by both of these women. The story begins way back in Ur of Chaldea when God told Abraham to get away from his country and his kindred and his father's house unto a land that God would show him. And God gave him some promises. He said, I will make of you a great nation, and be thou a blessing. Everybody that blessed Abraham, God was going to bless. Everybody that cursed Abraham, God was going to curse. And then he said to Abraham, In thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But Abraham didn't have any children. And he and Sarah had tried all of their married lives to have a child. And so he resorted to something which was legal in that day. He decided, with the consent of his wife, to have a child by Hagar, his handmaid. And so he cohabitated with her, and she gave birth to a son who was named Ishmael, which means God hears. Now before Ishmael was ever born, it was predicted that he would be a wild man. Every man's hand would be against him, and his hand would be against every man. And Ishmael was going to be representative of the old covenant of a legal covenant. Whenever you try to do anything legally speaking, there is always a hassle. For example, we read, I think, in our last lesson about the law of the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? The Jews never could really decide what they could and could not do on the Sabbath day. Always a matter of controversy. Four simple words, thou shalt not kill. Again, a matter of controversy. What constitutes a capital offense? Is capital punishment ordained of God or is it not? What about international war? Uh, what constitutes really a murder? The Bible says if a man is out chopping wood and an axe head inadvertently slips off the axe handle and kills somebody, that's not murder. Murder is defined by the intentions of the heart. So at any rate, Ishmael was a wild man. Wherever Ishmael was, there was a controversy. Wherever anyone expounds a philosophy of religion based on legalism, there will inevitably be a controversy. Well, Sarah was now a very old woman. As a matter of fact, the scriptures say she was past the age of bearing. She had gone through the change of life. She had wanted to have a child as a young woman, but she did not. And now she was an old woman. Her hopes were not only dead, in essence, 
they were twice dead. At that juncture, God appeared to Abram and told him that he was going to have a son by Sarah, his wife. And it seemed incredible. If they couldn't have a child when they were young and healthy, how would it be possible now that they were old? But you see, Isaac was a miracle son. And Abraham received strength to conceive seed when he was past the age of bearing. And he received that strength by means of his faith. You see, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Jesus that we might be justified by faith. It was to demonstrate the utter futility of, being try, of trying to be saved by law. Even Moses couldn't be saved by law. What makes you think you can be saved? Or that I can be saved by law? And so we're not saved by a legal principle or by an old covenant, but by a brand new concept which makes it possible for you and me to accomplish the impossible with God's help. We are born from above. We have a miraculous relationship with God so that the dead womb of our life can produce a brand new kind of life. The name Isaac means laughter. And wherever Ishmael was, there was a fight, an argument, a hassle. Wherever Isaac was, there was love, there was joy, there was a kind of peace. His very name signifies laughter and happiness. And that's really the essence of what you and I are involved in in Christianity. If we correctly understand what God is trying to communicate to us in the Holy Bible, we do not wind up filled with hatred and argumentation. We are rather characterized by love. Jesus put it like this, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. When the Bible teaches us to be perfect, as it does in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not talking about being sinless, but rather it's talking about being mature in the same way that Jesus was mature. Let me read to you from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Jesus said, You have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. He makes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. If you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the public and so? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publican so? Be you therefore perfect or mature in the same way that God is mature. One of the underlying fears that I have as I seek to teach you about the Holy Bible is that somehow you're going to start studying the Bible and you're going to wind up missing the most important thing in the Bible, which is the concept of love. I've just been reading from this two-volume biography on the life of Adolf Hitler by John Tolan. John Tolan is a Pulitzer Prize winning author who has written a number of books about World War II and about Adolf Hitler and the Battle of the Bulge. This is perhaps, uh, according to the cover, the most comprehensive definitive biography of Adolf Hitler that has ever been written. You might be surprised to discover that Adolf Hitler uh, dreamed of being a preacher. Grew up in a religious community right across the street from a Benedictine monastery. He admired the abbot. Used to stand in his own kitchen on a kitchen stool, draping himself in the maid's apron and preaching long and fervent sermons. As a matter of fact, the swastika came from the coat of arms of the Benedictine monastery. As a young man, uh, Hitler was blinded in World War I. And he prayed to God that if he could recover from his blindness, he would devote himself to public life. He felt that God had his hand upon him. And he actually thought that he was doing the work of Jesus Christ even when he was sentencing millions of Jews to death at Dachau, Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and the other death camps of Nazi Germany. What a puzzle that Adolf Hitler would read the Bible, claim to be a believer in Jesus Christ, 
go regularly to church. As a matter of fact, on his 50th anniversary, all the churches of Germany held a special mass in his honor. But he loved certain people, and he hated certain people. The message that I want you to get is that Jesus teaches us to love everybody. He said the publicans, the unbelievers, bad people can love their friends and hate their enemies. But if you want to be my, like me, said Jesus, or if you want to be like God, then you must love your enemies. You must do good to them that hate you. You must pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And you cannot do that on your own. In order for you or for me to be able to accomplish this kind of a miracle, we have to have the same kind of an experience as that which occurred in the life of Sarah and Abraham. We have to do something beyond the physical. We have to be born again. We have to be born from above. To know in the biblical sense means to become intimate with so that a new life is produced. The Bible teaches that Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore a son and they called his name Cain. To know means to become intimate with so that a brand new life is produced. It is my fervent prayer that by reading the Bible you will come to know God. That is, you will have an intimate experience with God and with Jesus Christ our Lord so that in you will come this brand new life capable of the kind of love personified in Jesus.